I hope you love doing audiobooks because you've spent a lot of time doing it. I better had. Um, <laughs> I do. I mean, obviously, with, with with all the work that we do, some are written magnificently, and you're living, uh, you're working hard to live up to the material, and others are eh, not so much. And then you're working hard to make them listenable in a as joyful and generous a way as you can. So there's always that that flex in them. But I love the fact that I've got to play characters that I would not necessarily have been cast in. You know, like I, I get to read The Tenant of Wildfell Hall and Bronte. I'm not immediate casting for The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, but I lived in Leeds for a long time. My mother's a historian. I grew up on Jean Plady and Georgette Heyer, so I can fall into that stuff in my sleep. Yeah. So uh, the audiobooks gives you the opportunity to, you know, just just be good at it, like doing it, and transmit that to the listener, please. Where do you stand on that thing of, you know, when you're you're reading something sad and you move yourself, uh, do you do you hold it together or do you think the reader likes to hear the reader moved? That's a really good question. Really good question. Um, as my children would tell you, I, I cry at Mary Poppins when they don't thank her before they go to fly the kite. I, I, I cry. Everything makes me cry. It's like, oh, God, <laughs> there she goes. There she goes. I get very moved by uh, certain books. And I think that's completely fine because I will also get very angry with them and I'll get very violent with them or very giddy with them. So I think it's fine. Just don't go on. Just qu- quit while you a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. You're upset. I'd like to hear the story. Do you mind? Just blow your nose and get back on. Was it just an expectation that you would be able to do African accents? Yes. I, I have a funny sounding name. I must be able to do the funny sounding voices. <laughs> Actually, that was really interesting. When I came to London as a young, uh, you know, girl from the West Country, I mean, obviously nobody was saying, how is your Gloucestershire? as opposed to your Somerset. I was all right with sort of what I heard from my family, from my dad. But in in theatre and in drama in general at that time, there wasn't much African stuff. There was West Indian stuff, but not African stuff. So what I had to do was go, OK, I've got the auntie who is Jamaican, who's married to one of my uncles. I have to go and listen to her. And I had to learn a West Indian accent. That's what I had to learn. Or, you know, I've got a Trini friend. Record all of this for me. I have to know it by tomorrow. That sort of thing. Um, and then the sort of the balance has tipped over into more African-y storylines. Now, there's much more African stuff than there ever was when I first came here in the early 80s. So there's been that sort of shift. And as an actor of colour, you've had to shift as well to ply your trade. And what's great is, I mean, I think colourblind casting has been, you know, in theatre a bit, but Bridgerton has really broken ground, hasn't it? Yes. I don't call it colourblind casting because Queen Charlotte was mixed race and there were 20,000 black people in London at that time and a fifth of the British Navy was African. Everybody was in London. So um, I, I know it's done it with bells on, but it's done everything with bells on. It's not, it's not a documentary. You know, it's 150% psychedelic. Regency at all times. So, so that's been fantastic for me, Graham, because, you know, I can, I can do that. I can, again, do those characters in my sleep. Thank you so much for doing this. It was really, really kind of you to do this. Bless you. Thanks for having me. 